Good day. Today we are discussing head injury and increases in intracranial pressure. Traumatic brain injury is brain function impairment that results from external force. The clinical manifestations represent a broad constellation of symptoms from brief confusion to coma, severe disability, and or death. Traumatic brain injury is classified as mild, which is GCS 14 to 15, and is often called concussion. And this label of mild is a misnomer. It can also be moderate with a GCS of 9 to 13, which accounts for approximately 10% of head injuries, and severe TBI or traumatic brain injury, which is GCS 3 to 8, with a mortality rate that approaches 40% with most deaths occurring in the first 48 hours after injury. As we mentioned earlier, it is based on the Glasgow Coma Scale. Fewer than 10% of patients with severe TBI experience good recovery. The prevalence of traumatic brain injury is twice as high in males as in females. Distribution of age at injury is trimodal with peaks at 0 to 4 years, 15 to 24 years, and older than 75 years of age. Mortality rate increases with age at the time of injury. Motor vehicle collisions are the primary cause of blunt head injury in young adults and children, and falls are more common in the elderly. Traumatic brain injury has been called the signature injury of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. For the pathophysiology, cerebral blood flow is influenced by the following factors, autoregulation, cerebral perfusion pressure, mean arterial pressure, and intracranial pressure. Under normal circumstances, autoregulation regulates local cerebral blood flow to maintain equilibrium between oxygen delivery and metabolism. Other systemic factors such as hypertension, hypocarbia, and alkalosis can affect cerebral blood flow by causing vasoconstriction. So the factors that affect cerebral blood flow when placed in an equation are MAP and CPP. MAP stands for mean arterial pressure and CPP is cerebral perfusion pressure. The formula for mean arterial pressure is diastolic blood pressure plus SBP, systolic blood pressure, minus diastolic blood pressure over 3. So you add the quotient of the difference between systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure and 3 to the diastolic blood pressure and for cerebral perfusion pressure it is the mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure under normal situations auto regulation can adjust to cerebral perfusion pressures from 50 to 150 millimeters mercury to maintain local cellular oxygen demands and regional cerebral blood flow in brain injury, autoregulation is often impaired, so even modest drops in blood pressure can decrease brain perfusion and result in cellular hypoxia. A cerebral perfusion pressure of less than 60 mm mercury is considered the lower limit of autoregulation in humans, below which local control of cerebral blood flow cannot be adjusted to maintain flow adequate for function. Traumatic hypotension leads to ischemia within low-flow regions of the injured brain, so aggressive fluid resuscitation may be required to prevent hypotension and secondary brain injury. In the absence of an ICP monitor, it is important to maintain a mean arterial pressure of greater than 80 mm mercury or equal to 80 mm mercury because low blood pressure in the setting of elevated intracranial pressure will result in a low cerebral perfusion pressure and brain injury. The cranium is an enclosed space with a fixed volume. Any changes to the volume of the intracranial content, such as bleeding, affect the intracranial pressure, and an increase in intracranial pressure can decrease the cerebral perfusion pressure. Intracranial pressure is determined by the volume of the three intracranial compartments. The brain parenchyma, which is less than 1,300 ml in the adult, cerebrospinal fluid, which is 100 to 150 ml, and intravascular blood, which is another 100 to 150 ml. When one compartment expands, there is a compensatory reduction in the volume of another and or the baseline ICP will increase. Elevations in ICP are life-threatening and may lead to a phenomenon known as the Cushing reflex, which is characterized by hypertension, bradycardia, and respiratory irregularity.
Hypertension is an attempt to maintain cerebral perfusion. Normal values for intracranial pressure vary with age. For adults, it's usually less than 10 to 15 millimeters mercury. For young children, it's between 3 and 7 millimeters mercury. And for infants, it's between 1.5 and 6.0 millimeters mercury. The initial insult associated with moderate and severe traumatic brain injury imparts mechanical forces that produce high levels of direct damage and strain to the brain parenchyma. The primary injuries include concussions, which are bruises to brain parenchyma, hematomas such as subdural, epidural, intraparenchymal, intraventricular, and subarachnoid, diffuse axonal injuries such as stress or damage to axons, direct cellular damage to the neurons, axons, and other supportive cells, loss of the blood-brain barrier, disruption of neurochemical homeostasis, and the loss of electrochemical function. A wave of secondary damage is unleashed by the impact that results in a series of deteleurious cellular and subcellular events, also known as the secondary neurotoxic cascade. The secondary neurotoxic cascade causes ongoing damage to the brain and ultimately results in a poorer neurologic outcome than might have occurred based on the original mechanism. The secondary neurotoxic cascade should not be confused with the term secondary insults, a term used in the clinical literature to describe conditions or circumstances such as hypotension, hypoxemia, and hyperglycemia that accelerate neurotoxic damage and worsen long-term outcome. Mediation of secondary insults reduces morbidity and mortality and is discussed in the treatment section. The secondary neurotoxic cascade is a massive release of neurotransmitters such as glutamate into the presynaptic space with activation of N-methyl-D-aspartate, alpha-amino-3-hydroxy-5-methyl-4-isoxazole-propionic acid, and other receptors. Ionic shifts activate cytoplasmic and nuclear enzymes, induce mitochondrial damage, and lead to cell death and necrosis. Pro-inflammatory cytokines and other enzymes are released in an attempt to clean and repair the damage. Secondary injury, however, is indiscriminate and produces extensive neuronal loss. Additionally, many survivable cells undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death during secondary injury. Apoptosis has been reported to occur longer than a year after injury. Brain edema results from two distinct processes and can be fatal in traumatic brain injury. Cellular swelling or cytotoxic edema results from large ionic shifts and the loss of cellular membrane integrity for mitochondrial damage, such as the loss of adenosine triphosphate, ion pump productivity, and increased free radical production. Extracellular edema results from direct damage to or the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, ionic shifts, and alteration of water exchange mechanisms such as aquaporins. As intracellular and extracellular water content rises, the brain swells and the ICP increases, leading to direct compressive tissue damage, vascular compression-induced ischemia, brain parenchyma herniation, and brain death. There are four major brain herniation syndromes, uncal transtentorial, central transtentorial, cerebellotonsillar, and upward posterior fossa. The most common is uncal herniation, which occurs when the uncus of the temporal lobe is displaced inferiorly through the medial edge of the tentorium. This is usually caused by an expanding lesion in the temporal lobe or lateral middle fossa. Uncal transtentorial herniation leads to compression of parasympathetic fibers running with the third cranial or oculomotor nerve, causing an ipsilateral fixed and dilated pupil due to an opposed sympathetic tone. Further herniation compresses the pyramidal tract, which results in contralateral motor paralysis. In some cases, the pupillary changes can be contralateral, whereas the motor changes are ipsilateral. Central transtentorial herniation is less common and occurs with midline lesions such as lesions of the frontal or occipital lobes or vertex. The most prominent symptoms are bilateral pinpoint pupils, bilateral Babinski signs, and increased muscle tone. Fixed midpoint pupils follow along with prolonged hyperventilation and decorticate posturing. Cerebellotonsillar herniation occurs when the cerebellar tonsils herniate through the foramen magnum. This may lead to pinpoint pupils, flaccid paralysis, and sudden death. Upward transtentorial herniation results from a posterior fossa lesion and leads to a conjugate downward gaze with absence of vertical eye movements and pinpoint pupils. 
As mentioned earlier, the severity of traumatic brain injury is classified using the Glasgow Comma Scale. The scale is composed of three components, eye opening, which has 1 to 4 points, verbal response, which has 1 to 5 points, and the motor response, which has 1 to 6 points. The sum of these components defines the TBI severity classification into severe, which is GCS 3 to 8, moderate, which is GCS 9 to 13, and mild, which is GCS 14 or 15. The motor score independently correlates with outcome as well as the full score. The GCS is an objective measurement of clinical status, correlates with outcome, is a reliable tool for inter-observer measurements, and is effective for measuring patient recovery or response to treatment over time. However, the scale has several limitations. It measures behavioral responses, not the underlying pathophysiology. Patients with a similar GCS score may have dramatically different underlying structural injuries and require different clinical interventions. It is not useful as a single acute measure of severity as it is a tool to measure disease progression over time. The GCS may additionally be affected by drugs, alcohol, medications, paralytics, or ocular injuries. Finally, the scale lacks the granularity necessary to assess mild TBI. So the Glasgow Comma Scale for all age groups, generally if it's a patient who is 4 years old to an adult, you have the classic Comma Scale where eye-opening is rated a 4 if it's spontaneous, 3 if it is open to speech, 2 if it is open to pain, and 1 if there's no response. Verbal response is 5 if the patient is alert and oriented, 4 if there's disoriented conversation, 3 if the patient is speaking but nonsensical, 2 if there are moans or unintelligible sounds, and 1 if there's no response. And for motor response, 6 is for patients who follow commands, 5 for those who localize pain, 4 to those who move or withdraw to pain, 3 for decorticate flexion, 2 for decerebrate extension, and one for no response. So the difference between the GCS in the child less than four years old and an infant is on the verbal response and motor response scoring. So you give a five to a child who is less than four years old if the patient is oriented, social, speaks, and interacts. Four if the patient has confused speech, disorientation, if the patient is consolable and aware. 3. If the patient speaks inappropriate words, is inconsolable and unaware. 2. If the patient is incomprehensible, agitated, restless, and unaware. For infants, you score a 5 if the patient coos and babbles. 4. If the infant has an irritable cry. 3. If the patient cries to pain. 2. If the patient moans to pain. And of course, 1. Is no response. For motor responses of children less than 4 years old, 6. Is if the child has normal spontaneous movements. 5. Is if the patient localizes pain. 4. If the patient withdraws to pain. 1 to 3 is basically the same with 3 being the corticate flexion, 2 being the cerebrate extension, and 1 being no response. And for infants who have motor responses, you have 6 for normal spontaneous movements, 5 if the patient withdraws to touch, 4 if the patient withdraws to pain. And 1 to 3 stay the same. The highest score for Glasgow comma scale is 15 and the lowest score is 3. The results of history, examination, and diagnostic imaging will allow the distinction of two categories of injury, moderate to severe brain injury and mild brain injury. In the history, we obtain an accurate history from the patient, witnesses, and emergency medical service crews to gain important insight into the mechanism of injury and overall severity of the traumatic brain injury, such as the height of fall, impact surface condition, damage sustained to a vehicle, airbag deployment, seatbelt use, history of ejection from the vehicle, or report of fatalities at the scene. Premorbid medical history, medications, especially anticoagulants, drug use, and or alcohol intoxication are also important in the assessment and treatment of acute TBI. Initial clinical findings and physical exam, as reported by the Emergency Medical Service, is an essential component of triaging and managing traumatic brain injury. The presence of a focal neurologic deficit, seizures, emesis, or depressed level of consciousness increases concern for underlying brain injury. 
We follow advanced trauma life support principles to perform a trauma-focused examination with simultaneous life-saving procedures as needed. We protect the cervical spine during evaluation, treatment, and imaging. First, we obtain the GCS. Then, we determine pupillary response. In an unresponsive patient, a single fixed and dilated pupil may indicate an intracranial hematoma with uncal herniation that requires rapid surgical decompression. Bilateral fixed and dilated pupils suggest increased intracranial pressure with poor brain perfusion, bilateral uncal herniation, drug effects such as atropine or severe hypoxia. Bilateral pinpoint pupils suggest either opiate exposure or a central pontine lesion. Altered motor function can indicate brain, spinal cord, or peripheral nerve injuries. We assess movement in a coma patient by observing the patient's reaction to noxious stimuli such as pressure to a nail bed. Decorticate posturing, which is upper extremity flexion and lower extremity extension, indicates severe intracranial injury above the level of the midbrain. The cerebrate posturing, which is arm extension and internal rotation with wrist and finger flexion and internal rotation and extension of the lower extremities, indicates a more caudal injury. So again, decorticate posturing indicates severe intracranial injury above the level of the midbrain and the cerebrate posturing indicates a more caudal injury. For completely unresponsive patients, respiratory pattern and eye movements can provide information regarding brainstem function. Remember, we do not assess oculovestibular and oculocephalic responses in a patient under cervical spine precautions. We individually assess each patient's mechanism of injury, history, comorbidities, and signs and symptoms when determining the need for CT imaging of the head and cervical spine. Head CT is exquisitely sensitive to the presence of blood and guides emergency management. We do not delay head CT scan because expanding hemorrhagic lesions need emergency neurosurgical intervention. Therefore, if the patient is uncooperative or combative, intubation and sedation are often the best options to enable rapid CT imaging. Other means to control agitated patients with traumatic brain injury include midazolam at 1 to 2 mg IV and propofol at 20 mg every 10 seconds to the desired effect. Several decision rules have been developed to minimize unnecessary head CT imaging. The guidelines strive to identify patients with surgical emergencies. These studies do not specifically address the relationship between minor CD findings, which may place the patient at risk for the development of seizures, the duration of post-concussive symptoms, and progressive changes on CT during the course of a patient's evaluation. Adults with mild traumatic brain injury and the GCS score of 14 or 15 will have an intracranial lesion on CD about 15% of the time, but less than 1% will require neurosurgical intervention. The prevalence of cervical fractures in comatose TBI patients is approximately 8%, and an estimated 4% of injuries are missed on the initial assessment of the trauma patient. Cervical imaging is a vital component in the care of the brain-injured patient. Perform CD imaging of the cervical spine in patients with altered mental status and who are injured by a mechanism that increases the risk of cervical spine injury. CT is superior to plain radiography in patients with altered mental status and can be performed at the same time as the head CT. MRI can detect subtle lesions missed by CT imaging and can better define the extent of concussions. However, MRI may not detect subtle lesions, cannot be performed if the patient is unstable and is not always available. Decision rules can guide clinical practice, but each patient must be assessed individually, and none of the rules described below address short- or long-term non-operative sequelae of TBI. The most commonly used evidence-based clinical decision rules for head CT in adults are the New Orleans Criteria and the Canadian CT Head Rule. Both rules have been validated and are 100% sensitive in detecting patients who will need neurosurgical intervention, but they have limited specificity with 5% versus 37% respectively. The Canadian CD head rule is less sensitive if intracranial lesion is the defined endpoint. A negative feature of these two decision rules is that loss of consciousness or amnesia is required as the entry point. Most minor brain injury events do not result in a loss of consciousness, and loss of consciousness is not the best predictor of intracranial pathology. Do not apply these rules to patients taking anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents or to children because these variables were not included in the validation studies.
So the New Orleans criteria and Canadian CT head rule clinical decision rules for the New Orleans criteria usually with a GCS of 15 and presence of any one finding indicates the need for CT scan. Headache, vomiting, age older than 60 years old, intoxication, persistent antegrade amnesia, evidence of trauma above the clavicles, and seizure. And identification of patients who have an intracranial lesion on CT is 100% sensitive and 5% specific. And identification of patients who will need neurosurgical intervention is 100% sensitive and 5% specific. The Canadian CT head rule can be applied in a GCS of 13 to 15. And again, presence of any one of the following indicates the need for CT scan. GCS at less than 15 at 2 hours, suspected open or depressed skull fracture, age of older than or equal to 65 years old, more than one episode of vomiting, retrograde amnesia of greater than 30 minutes, a dangerous mechanism such as a fall greater than 3 feet or struck as a pedestrian, or any sign of basal skull fracture. As mentioned earlier, Canadian CT head rule is less sensitive but more specific for both intracranial lesions on CT and neurosurgical intervention. For pre-hospital care of these patients, early appropriate management can have a profound impact on the patient's final outcome. For patients with moderate to severe head injury, we provide stabilization and rapid transport to a facility with experience in the management of brain injury. The most important pre-hospital interventions are airway and blood pressure management. If the patient needs pre-hospital intubation, Avoid hyperventilation, which causes cerebral vasoconstriction and can negatively affect outcome, and use capnometry to keep TCO2 at 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. Treat hypotension aggressively. If transport times are short, do not give mannitol or hypertonic saline for elevated ICP. So, for CD scanning for adults with brain injury, according to the American College of Emergency Physicians guidelines, adults with a Glasgow Coma score of less than 15 at the time of evaluation should undergo CT imaging. Mild traumatic brain injury with or without loss of consciousness, if one or more of the following is present, a Glasgow Coma scale score of less than 15, focal neurologic findings, vomiting more than two times, moderate to severe headache, age older than 65 years old, physical signs of basilar skull fracture, coagulopathy, dangerous mechanisms of injury such as a fall greater than 4 feet. Of note is that this rule is different from the Canadian CT head rule which has fall of greater than 3 feet here for the American College of Emergency Physicians, it's greater than 4 feet. Mild traumatic brain injury with loss of consciousness or amnesia, if one or more of the following is present, we do CT scan. Drug or alcohol intoxication, physical evidence above the clavicles, persistent amnesia, and post-traumatic seizures. The primary goals of emergency treatment are to maintain cerebral perfusion and oxygenation by optimizing intravascular volume and ventilation, prevent secondary injury by correcting hypoxia, hypercapnia, hyperglycemia, hyperthermia, anemia, or hypoperfusion, recognize and treat elevated intracranial pressure, arrange for neurosurgical intervention to evacuate intracranial mass lesions, and treat other life-threatening injuries. A systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters mercury and hypoxemia with a PaO2 of less than 60 are associated with a 150% increased risk in mortality. We observe for the signs and symptoms of elevated ICP such as changes in mental status, pupillary irregularities, focal neurologic deficits, the cerebrate or decorticate posturing, or CT pathology. Some CT signs of intracranial hypertension are the attenuation of the visibility of the sulci and gyri because the brain is compressed against the skull, compressed lateral ventricles, and poor gray-white matter distinction. Papilledema may not be evident if pressure rises rapidly. Sedation and analgesia may decrease baseline ICP and prevent transient rises in ICP from agitation, coughing, or gagging from the endotracheal tube. Prevent and control seizure activity. We treat hypotension, hypoxemia, hypercarbia, and hyperglycemia. A single occurrence of hypotension and hypoxia after brain injury is associated with a 150 increase in mortality. 
TBI is so progressive, so appropriate early management will have a greater impact on the outcome than treatments initiated after neuronal cell death and the development of secondary injury, such as cerebral edema. We jointly develop and apply goal-directed protocols with emergency medicine, trauma, neurosurgery, and intensive care teams. Treat any condition that compromises ventilation, such as altered mental status, facial or neck trauma, and pneumothorax. Patients with severe injury or a GCS score of less than or equal to 8 require intubation. Use short-acting induction agents that have limited effect on blood pressure or ICP. We avoid nasotracheal intubation if facial trauma or basilar skull fracture is evident or suspected. We monitor blood pressure throughout the procedure. Pre-induction agents such as low-dose succinylcholine, vecuronium, pancuronium, and lidocaine do not improve outcome but can be used as adjuncts if they do not delay airway control. Maintain inline cervical spine stabilization during intubation. We maintain oxygenation and use capnometry to control pCO2 and avoid hyperventilation. Prolonged, that is, more than 6 hours of hypocapnia causes cerebral vasoconstriction and worsens cerebral ischemia. We keep oxygen saturation at greater than 90, PaO2 at greater than 60, and PCO at 35 to 45. So, emergency treatment of brain injury has a checklist as follows. For the cervical spine, we give spinal precautions. For the airway, we maintain the airway, intubate for GCS less than 8 or as needed. Oxygenation and ventilation must be at 90% for oxygen saturation or higher and a PCO2 of 35 to 45. Systolic blood pressure should be greater than 90 mm mercury, map at at least 80 mm mercury. We give normal saline, blood products, or transfuse as needed. No permissive hypotension in this case. Pressors may be required if fluids are not sufficient. For examine GCS, perform GCS scoring before paralytics if possible. Tre treat life-threatening injuries and active bleeding. Serial GCS is helpful in identifying change. Keep goal of brain resuscitation as top priority. Immediately, we order head CT and cervical spine CT so that we can identify mass lesions and signs of increased ICP and protect the cervical spine until it is cleared. We also repeat the exam. We check GCS for changes and signs of impending herniation or deterioration, and a change of more than two points should prompt further workup. We check glucose and treat hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia because hyperglycemia is bad for the brain. For temperature, we maintain it between 36 degrees Celsius and 38.3 degrees Celsius. We can also do aggressive cooling if there is hyperthermia with paracetamol or a cooling blanket. For seizure prophylaxis, we can give an anti-epileptic drug if GCS is less than or equal to 10, acute seizures with injury or abnormal head CT scan. Usually, phenytoin, phosphenytoin, or levetiracetam are used for these indications. We identify and treat elevated ICP and herniation, keep the head of the bed at 30 degrees, ensure good blood pressure, ventilation, and temperature control, give mannitol 1 gram per kilogram IV bolus, and do urgent neurosurgical consult. We also consider adding hypertonic saline at 3%, 250 ml per 30 minutes for refractory elevations in ICP, and we monitor blood pressure and electrolytes. Neurosurgery referral or transfer for advanced care can also be done. We also monitor ICP. Neurosurgery may do a ventriculostomy for ICP management, aggressive tiered approach to management, and emergency surgery. So we do ICP monitoring and CSF diversion in GCS scores of less than or equal to 8. Traumatic hypotension leads to ischemia within low-flow regions of the injured brain. Ischemia amplifies the neurotoxic cascade and increases cerebral edema. Provide aggressive fluid resuscitation to prevent hypotension and secondary brain injury. We maintain systolic blood pressure at greater than 90 mm mercury and the MAP of greater than 80 mm mercury. A blood pressure within normal range may be inadequate to maintain adequate flow and cerebral perfusion pressure if intracranial pressure is increased. Permissive hypotension worsens outcome in patients with brain injury.
Isolated head injury rarely produces hypotension except as a preterminal event. Hypovolemic shock may be seen with polytrauma, massive blood loss from scalp lacerations, or in small children from subgaleal hematoma. If fluid and blood resuscitation is not effective, we use vasopressors to preserve cerebral perfusion. Pain and increased ICP can cause hypertension. Treat pain and assess for impending herniation or the Cushing reflex. And for patient positioning, we raise the head of the bed since this may improve cerebral blood flow by lowering ICP. However, the interaction between ICP, MEP, and tissue oxygenation is complex and highly variable. Response to position change depends on many factors such as degree of intact autoregulation, brain compliance, and individual patient variability. There is still uncertainty as to whether this procedure is beneficial, but in the setting of suspected elevated intracranial pressure, it is currently recommended as a simple maneuver to improve cerebral blood flow. One must ensure that the patient's blood pressure is maintained above the minimum recommended level of 80 millimeters mercury because elevation of 30 degrees can drop the mean pressure within the brain by up to 10 to 15 millimeters mercury and improve cerebral perfusion pressure. Again, we remember that cerebral perfusion pressure is MAP minus ICP. So lowering the ICP improves CPP, but lowering MAP in the setting of hypotension can be counterproductive and lower cerebral perfusion pressure. Elevating the head of the bed to 30 degrees can be safely accomplished even when the spine has not been cleared, so as long as neck movement is secured. Hyperglycemia in the setting of neurologic injury, both stroke and TBI, is associated with worse outcome. Tight hyperglycemic control is recommended in patients with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. Insulin drips may be required to achieve adequate control with a glucose of 10, 100 to 180 milligrams per deciliter or 5.5 to 9.9 millimoles per liter. Elevated temperature is associated with an increased metabolic demand and excessive glutamate release. Evaluated Elevated temperature elevates ICP and worsens outcome in many neurologic critical care conditions including TBI. Treat fever with a goal of normothermia. The evidence for hypothermia in TBI is not sufficient to recommend its use. Seizures after head injury can change the neurologic examination, alter oxygen delivery and cerebral blood flow, and increase ICP. Prolonged seizures can worsen secondary injury. Treat acute seizures with IV lorazepam, and if seizures continue, treat as for status epilepticus. We give prophylactic phenytoin, phosphenytoin, if the GCS is less than or equal to 10, if the patient has an abnormal head CT scan, or if the patient has had an acute seizure after the injury. The dose is 18 mg per kilogram intravenously at 25 mg per minute. Prophylactic anticonvulsants reduce the occurrence of post-traumatic seizures within the first week. Phenytoin or phosphenytoin is the agent most studied. Leviteracetam can be used, but there is less data supporting its use. Steroids have no role. So intubation agents in brain injury include the following. Induction agents can be etomidate, 0.3 mg per kilogram IV. It may be neuroprotective, may lower intracranial pressure, and adrenal suppression is unlikely with a single use. And propofol 1 to 3 mg per kilogram IV with a rapid onset and offset it has anti-seizure properties. It can cause hypotension if there is inadequate fluid resuscitation, however. And paralytics include succinylcholine at 1 to 1.5 mg per kilogram IV. It is short-acting. We avoid it in burns and extensive muscle injury. And rocuronium at 0.6 to 1.0 mg per kilogram IV. It is short-acting and safe in hyperkalemia. For cerebral herniation, we use patient history and physical examination to identify signs and symptoms of impending herniation. Indicators of rising ICP include severe headache, visual changes, numbness, focal weakness, nausea, vomiting, seizure, change in mental status, lethargy, hypertension, coma, bradycardia, and agonal respirations. Signs of impending transtentorial herniation include unilateral or bilateral pupillary dilation, hemiparesis, motor posturing, and or progressive neurologic deterioration. We measure neurologic deterioration by comparing sequential GCS scores. In a patient with rapidly deteriorating Reading GCS. If time permits, we obtain a repeat head CT to identify an expanding intracranial hematoma.
Mannitol and or hypertonic saline can lower ICP. Mannitol is an osmotic agent that can reduce ICP and improve cerebral blood flow, CPP, and brain metabolism. Mannitol is also a free radical scavenger. It generally has an effect within 30 minutes. Mannitol expands plasma volume and can improve oxygen carrying capacity. We administer mannitol by repetitive bolus of 0.25 to 1 gram per kilogram and not by constant infusion. Because no dose-dependent effect is seen with mannitol, some clinicians advocate beginning at the lower range of the suggested dose. Mannitol results in a net intravascular volume loss because of its diuretic effect. Monitor the patient's input and output. Osmotic diuresis is relatively contraindicated in hemorrhage and hypotension. However, in the setting of acute herniation, mannitol has been demonstrated to effectively reduce life-threatening elevations of ICP. Hypertonic saline may be used as an alternative to mannitol in the patient who is not adequately fluid resuscitated or hypotensive. The Brain Trauma Foundation indicates that at this time, data support the primary use of mannitol for the acute treatment of ICP. Most emergency rooms have 3% sodium chloride available. The dose for adults is 250 ml over 30 minutes. Intensive care units may stock 23.4% sodium chloride solution. The dose for adults is 30 ml over 30 minutes. We monitor serum osmolality and serum sodium. Mannitol and hypertonic saline may be given serially and in conjunction with one another. Advanced treatment of brain injury requires invasive and close monitoring. So cerebral perfusion pressure management. If the GCS is less than or equal to 8, we arrange for placement of an intracranial bolt or extraventricular drain with monitoring capabilities as soon as possible to monitor ICP and direct treatment. We maintain cerebral perfusion pressure at 55 to 60 millimeters mercury to adequately perfuse brain tissue. Increasing cerebral perfusion pressure at more than 70 millimeters mercury may result in injury to other organs such as acute respiratory distress syndrome from lung tissue trauma. We consider ICP monitoring for patients with a normal admission brain CT scan if two or more of the following criteria are met. Age over 40 years, unilateral or bilateral motor posturing, and systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters mercury. In addition, we provide ICP monitoring in patients undergoing emergency surgery such as orthopedic repair. Management of cerebral perfusion pressure is essential intraoperatively where the patient with elevated ICP may experience large shifts in central volume status due to surgical blood loss. An ICP of greater than 20 millimeters mercury increases morbidity and mortality. Early consultation with neurosurgery for direct ICP monitoring, cerebrospinal fluid diversion, or surgical intervention is highly recommended in moderate and severe traumatic brain injury. In certain circumstances, an ICP monitor will be placed in the emergency room by neurosurgery to help guide medical management of ICP as well as for direct cerebrospinal fluid diversion to lower ICP. So, when it comes to the goal-directed therapy of brain injury, we have the following suggested targets. Pulse oximetry at greater than or equal to 90%, systolic blood pressure at greater than or equal to 90 millimeters mercury, MAP of greater than or equal to 80 millimeters mercury, PaCO2 of 35 to 45 millimeters mercury, temperature of 36.0 to 38.3 degrees Celsius, CPP or cerebral perfusion pressure of greater than or equal to 60 millimeters mercury, ICP of less than 20 millimeters mercury, PBTO2 at greater than or equal to 15 millimeters mercury, pH at 7.35 to 7.45, glucose at 80 to 180 milligrams per deciliter, physiologic sodium at 135 to 140 mex per liter, INR at less than or equal to 1.4, platelets at greater than or equal to 75 times 10 to the third per microliter, and hemoglobin of greater than or equal to 8 grams per deciliter. For specific head injuries, let's start with scalp lacerations. Scalp lacerations can lead to massive blood loss, so control bleeding as rapidly as possible. If direct pressure is not effective, we locally infiltrate lidocaine with epinephrine and clamp or ligate bleeding vessels. Before closure, carefully examine the wounds to identify foreign bodies, underlying fractures, and galleal lacerations. Large galleal disruptions should be repaired. For skull fractures, patients who have or are suspected of having a skull fracture require a head CT scan. Skull fractures are usually categorized by location, such as basilar versus skull convexity, 
pattern, such as linear, depressed, or comminuted, and whether they are open or closed. A linear scarl fracture with an overlying laceration is an open fracture. Explore wounds gently to avoid driving bone fragments into the brain. Fractures that cross the middle meningeal artery, a major venous sinus, or linear occipital fractures have high intracerebral complication rates, and patients with skull fractures that are open or depressed, involve a sinus, or are associated with pneumocephalus, should be given antibiotics, usually vancomycin 1 gram IV and ceftriaxone 2 grams IV. A skull fracture that is depressed by more than the thickness of the skull usually requires operative repair. For basilar skull fracture and cerebrospinal fluid leaks, the presence of a basilar skull fracture is a significant risk factor for intracranial injury. The most common basilar skull fracture involves the petrous portion of the temporal bone, the external auditory canal, and the tympanic membrane. It is associated with dural tearing, which often leads to autorrhea or rhinorrhea. Basilar skull fractures may occur anywhere along the skull base from the crib reform plate through the occipital condyles. Do not place a nasogastric tube through the nares if crib reform plate fracture is suspected because this can lead to direct intracranial injury. Signs and symptoms associated with basilar skull fractures include cerebrospinal fluid leak, mastoid ecchymosis or the battle sign, periorbital ecchymosis or raccoon eyes, hemotympanum, vertigo, decreased hearing or deafness, and seventh nerve palsy. Periorbital and mastoid ecchymosis develop gradually over hours after an injury and are often absent in the emergency room. Cerebrospinal fluid leaks such as autorrhea or rhinorrhea are difficult to diagnose. However, the patient often complains of discharge of clear fluid from the nose or ears. Fluid may be collected and sent for analysis through the identification of beta transferrin. The beta-2 transferrin isoform of transferrin is found only in cerebrospinal fluid and not in blood, mucus, or tears. Patients with acute cerebrospinal fluid leaks are at risk for meningitis. Antibiotic prophylaxis is often recommended to reduce the incidence of infection. Administration of antibiotics should be done in consultation with the neurosurgeon who will be following the patient. If prophylactic antibiotics are instituted, the drug selected should have broad coverage with good penetration into the meninges, such as ceftriaxone, 2 grams intravenously, and vancomycin, 1 gram intravenously. The head of the patient's bed should be elevated to 30 degrees. A lumbar drain is often placed by the neurosurgical team. Cerebrospinal fluid leaks may require repair by a neurosurgeon or otolaryngologists. Contitions most commonly occur in the subfrontal cortex, in the frontal and temporal lobes, and occasionally in the occipital lobes. They are often associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Contitions may occur at the site of the blunt trauma or on the opposite side of the brain, also known as a contracoup injury. Intracerebral hemorrhage can occur days after significant blunt trauma, often at the site of resolving contusions. This complication is more common in patients with coagulopathy. CT scan findings immediately after injury may be normal. We obtain serial CTs if any change in mental status occurs in a patient with coagulopathy until the clot is stable. For subarachnoid hemorrhage, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage results from the disruption of the parenchyma in subarachnoid vessels and presents with blood in the cerebrospinal fluid. Patients with isolated traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage may present with headache, photophobia, and meningeal signs. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage is the most common CD abnormality in patients with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. Patients with early development of traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage have a three-fold higher mortality risk than those without traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is 42% versus 14% respectively. Some traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhages can be missed on early CD scans. Generally, CD scans performed 6 to 8 hours after injury are sensitive for detecting traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. An epidural hematoma results when blood collects in the potential space between the skull and the dura mater. Blunt trauma to the temporal or temporoparietal area with an associated skull fracture and middle meningeal arterial disruption is the primary mechanism of injury. Occasionally, trauma to the parieto-occipital region or the posterior fossa causes tears of the venous sinuses with epidural hematomas. The classic history of an epidural hematoma involves a significant blood head trauma with a loss of consciousness or altered sensorium, followed by a lucid period and subsequent rapid neurologic demise. This clinical presentation occurs in a minority of cases.
Traumatic blows to the thin temporal bone over the lateral aspect of the head carry the highest risk, such as in baseball or pool stick injury. And the diagnosis of an epidural hematoma is based on CD scan and physical examination findings. The CT appearance of an epidural hematoma is a biconvex or football-shaped mass typically found in the temporal region. The high-pressure arterial bleeding of an epidural hematoma can lead to herniation within hours after an injury. Early recognition and evacuation reduces morbidity and mortality. Underlying injury of the brain parenchyma is often absent, and full recovery may be expected if the hematoma is evacuated prior to herniation or the development of neurologic deficits. Subdural hematoma is caused by sudden acceleration-deceleration of brain parenchyma with subsequent tearing of the bridging dural veins. This results in hematoma formation between the dura matter and the arachnoid. Subdural hematoma tends to collect more slowly than epidural hematoma because of its venous origin. However, subdural hematoma is often associated with concurrent brain injury and underlying parenchymal damage. Brains with extensive atrophy, such as in the elderly or in chronic alcoholics, are more susceptible to the development of acute subdural hematoma. Even seemingly benign falls from standing position can result in subdural bleeding in the elderly. Children who are less than 2 years old are also at increased risk of subdural hematoma. Traditionally, subdural hematomas have been classified as acute, subacute, or chronic depending on the length of time from onset and occurrence of active hemorrhage. Acute symptoms usually develop within 14 days of the injury. After two weeks, the term chronic subdural hematoma is used. There is no specific clinical syndrome associated with the subdural hematoma. Acute cases usually present immediately after severe trauma and often the patient is unconscious. In the elderly or in alcohol, chronic subdural hematomas may result in vague complaints or mental status changes. Often, there is no recall of injury. On CT scan, acute subdural hematomas are hyperdense, which appears as white, crescent-shaped lesions that cross suture lines. Subacute subdural hematomas are isodense and are more difficult to identify. CT scanning with IV contrast or MRI can assist in identifying a subacute subdural hematoma. A chronic subdural hematoma appears hypodense or dark because iron in the blood has been metabolized. The definitive treatment depends on the type, size, effect on underlying brain parenchyma, and associated brain injury. Mortality and the need for surgical repair are greater for acute and subacute subdural hematomas. Chronic subdural hematomas can sometimes be managed without surgery depending on the severity of symptoms. Diffuse axonal injury is the disruption of axonal fibers in the white matter in brainstem. Shearing forces on the neurons generated by sudden deceleration cause diffuse axonal injury. The condition is seen after blunt trauma such as from a motor vehicle crash. In infant, shaken baby syndrome is a well-described cause. In severe diffuse axonal injury, edema can develop rapidly. The underlying injury can result in devastating and often irreversible neurologic deficits. A CT scan of a patient with diffuse axonal injury may appear normal, but classic CD findings include punctuate hemorrhagic injury along the gray-white junction of the cerebral cortex and within the deep structures of the brain. Treatment options are very limited, but an attempt should be made to prevent secondary damage by reducing cerebral edema and limiting pathologic increases in ICP. For penetrating injuries, as a bullet passes through the brain, it creates a cavity three to four times larger than its diameter. Direct penetration of the bullet through the brain substance and transfer of kinetic energy can cause the majority of the destruction. The GCS can be used to predict the prognosis for non-intoxicated patients with a gunshot wound to the brain. And let's compare intracranial injuries based on the type of patient, anatomic location, CD findings, common causes, and classic symptoms. Epidural intracranial injuries are usually in young patients. It's rare in the elderly and those with an age less than 2 years old. It's located in the potential space between the skull and dura matter. In CT scan, it's biconvex and it's a football-shaped hematoma. Commonly, it's caused by skull fracture with tear of the middle meningeal artery. We have classic symptoms of immediate loss of consciousness with a lucid period prior to deterioration, but this only occurs in about 20%. Subdural intracranial injuries are of higher risk in the elderly and alcoholic patients. It occurs in the space between the dura matter and the arachnoid. On CT scan, it is crescent or sickle shape, and common cause is use of acceleration deceleration with tearing of the bridging veins. In acute subdural 
intracranial injuries, there is rapid loss of consciousness with a lucid period possible, and if chronic, there is altered mental state and behavior with gradual decrease in consciousness. Subarachnoid injuries may occur in any age group after blood trauma. It is located in the subarachnoid space. In CT scan, you would see blood in the basilar cisterns and hemispheric sulci and fissures. It is often caused by acceleration-deceleration with tearing off the subarachnoid vessels this time. Classic symptoms be meningeal signs and symptoms, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe traumatic brain injury. And for concussions or intracerebral hematoma, it can occur in any age group after blunt trauma. Usually, it's in the anterior, temporal, or posterior frontal lobe. CT findings may be normal initially with delayed bleed, and common causes are severe or penetrating trauma or shaken baby syndrome, and symptoms range from normal to loss of consciousness. Patients with a GCS score of less than 8 and reactive pupils have a 25% mortality risk, whereas mortality approaches 100% in those with a GCS score of less than 5. Patients with a penetrating gunshot wound to the brain should be intubated and treated with prophylactic antibiotics such as vancomycin 1 gram intravenously and ceftriaxone 2 grams intravenously. Stab wounds have very low energy and impart only direct damage to the area contacted by the penetrating object. Patients with penetrating injury require admission, broad-spectrum antibiotics, and operative intervention. We leave impaled objects in place until controlled surgical removal is facilitated. Mild traumatic brain injury, which is often called a concussion, is impairment in brain function without overt hemorrhage or other gross lesions, is caused by an external force, and results in a GCS score of 14 or 15. The diagnosis is made by a history of any alteration in consciousness at the time or shortly after the inciting event, such as acceleration, deceleration, or blunt force. Alteration in consciousness includes the individual's account of getting his or her bell rung, seeing stars, or being dazed or confused as a result of the force. The presence of amnesia further supports the diagnosis and is often associated with more significant injury. Signs and symptoms such as vomiting, headache, loss of consciousness, focal neurologic deficit, age of greater than 65 years, coagulopathy, and or dangerous mechanism of injury are factors that increase risk of serious injury. The presence of alcohol, distracting injuries, and other barriers to obtaining a clear history of the event confound the signs and symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury. In its mildest form, Mild traumatic brain injury is an ionic shift that causes a momentary disruption in function. Symptom recovery is rapid and the concussive injury results in no obvious structural damage. However, mild insults can also cause a temporary upregulation of ion channels, especially along axons. After a single injury, the ion channel density returns to normal over time. Repeated exposure to injury, however, greatly increases the resting number of channels. An increase in the density of ion channels leaves the brain vulnerable to overactivation, neuronal toxicity, and cell death. In addition to ion channel upregulation, large shifts of balance in ion concentrations may lead to mitochondrial dysfunction and depletion of intracellular energy stores in mild traumatic brain injury. This state creates a metabolic mismatch during which neuronal dysfunction persists until recovery occurs. This pathway is a recognized pattern of injury in moderate or severe TBI and is thought to also play a role in mild TBI. Metabolic insults, electrochemical imbalances such as calcium influx and sodium and potassium shifts, and mitochondrial dysfunction also result in damage to axonal transport systems. Structural abnormalities are not always identified on MRI or CD. However, histopathology shows microscopic injury. Indeed, evidence of damage on diffusion tensor imaging has been demonstrated in high school athletes after a single football session, even without clinical signs or symptoms of a concussion. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is hypothesized to occur as a result of repeated exposure to traumatic brain injury in sports. Repetitive concussions can result in long-term cognitive deficits and structural damage to the brain. In extreme cases, when a second concussion pr occurs prior to recovery from the first, rapid onset of cerebral edema and death can occur, particularly in athletes prematurely returning to play, also known as second impact syndrome. The physical examination findings in isolated mild traumatic brain injury are often normal. 
Currently, there are no reliable tests that can confirm the diagnosis of concussion. The GCS lacks the detail to assess the full spectrum of signs and symptoms. Head CT scans are usually normal, and the normal scan only eliminates the concern for an underlying lesion requiring surgery. We perform a thorough neurologic examination and obtain the GCS. Focal findings suggest potential intracranial pathology or a post-ictal state. Assess for signs of global impairment such as confusion, preservation, or amnesia. Observe gait and test balance. The most consistent abnormality in mild traumatic brain injury is subtle impairment in cognitive function. The gold standard written neuropsychological examination is impractical to perform in an emergency setting. However, perform some assessment of cognition. Clinical symptoms may begin immediately after the insult or may be delayed for days to weeks. Therefore, the lack of obvious signs and symptoms at the time of evaluation does not exclude maltraumatic brain injury if the historical account is consistent with such injury. Another complicating factor is that many of the signs and symptoms are nonspecific and overlap with those of other conditions. The practice of grading concussions is widely employed but is not evidence-based. There are more than 20 different classification systems in existence. CR markers specific to neurologic injury may improve further diagnosis and management. Of the biomarkers currently under study, S100B, or calcium binding protein B antibody, is the only one that is relatively sensitive, 94 to 99% sensitive, for detecting the presence of injury but only under specific conditions. S100B serum levels rise and fall rapidly, so time from injury determines the relevance of a negative finding. S100B is also not currently approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for Mild Traumatic Brain Injury. It is recommended at Level C by the American College of Emergency Physicians. So, signs and symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury include cognitive symptoms, physical signs and symptoms, and behavioral changes. Cognitive symptoms include attention difficulties, concentration problems, amnesia and perseveration, short-term and long-term memory problems, orientation problems, altered processing speed, altered reaction time, calculation difficulties, and problems with executive function. At three months after injury, less than 30% are symptomatic, and at one year, 15% are symptomatic. Physical signs and symptoms include headaches, dizziness, insomnia, fatigue, uneven gait, nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, and seizures. And behavioral changes include irritability, depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, emotional liability, loss of initiative, loneliness and helplessness, problems related to jobs, relationships, home, or school management. Cognitive testing in the emergency room is currently limited to the use of brief memory screens such as the mini-cog or the quick confusion scale. Other tools, primarily developed for sports such as the sports concussion assessment tool and the standardized assessment for concussion, have not been validated for emergency use. Neuropsychological testing consists of a battery of individual tests that evaluate a number of domains required for normal brain function, including memory, attention, concentration, executive function, and reaction time. Several of these tests are used by sports programs to assess recovery from concussion. They are most valuable when baseline scores are available for comparison. The primary treatment for mild traumatic brain injury is rest. Make sure that the patient avoids aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs after acute injury. Emergency treatment objectives are to identify patients who have intracranial lesions requiring neurosurgical intervention, to admit patients whose condition might deteriorate over time, and for those discharged to provide instructions for cognitive and physical rest and provide follow-up for reassessment before return to normal activities. When a patient is safe for discharge, one of the most important interventions is to provide thorough concussion discharge instructions. Symptoms reflect underlying metabolic dysfunction and are currently the only reliable guide to brain health. Return to play or work decisions are based on symptoms and a graded evaluation program. Assessments incorporate serial, serial symptom checklists, neuropsychological tests such as memory and reaction time assessment, and a balance evaluation. Because this type of assessment is not practical in the emergency setting, emergency room physician Emergency department clinicians should not provide definitive return to activity directions. So return to activity programs are as follows. For sports related, there could be no activity and rest until symptom free, light aerobic exercise, sport specific training, non-contact, non-contract drills, full contact drills, 
full contact drills, and gameplay. The patient must remain asymptomatic for 24 hours between each step. Development of symptoms at any level requires return to the previous symptom-free level. Non-sports related return to activity includes no activity, rest until symptom-free, light aerobic exercise, moderate aerobic exercise, and then return to normal activities. Special considerations include post-concussive syndrome, recurrent concussion, second impact syndrome, and anticoagulation. For post-concussive syndrome, patients often report a series of physical, emotional, and cognitive symptoms in the days and weeks after mild traumatic brain injury. The estimated prevalence of post-concussive syndrome varies widely, with about 20 to 40 percent of patients reporting symptoms at three months and about 15 percent at one year. The most commonly reported post-concussion symptoms are headache, dizziness, decreased concentration, memory problems, sleep disturbances, irritability, fatigue, visual disturbances, judgment problems, depression, and anxiety. When a cluster of symptoms becomes chronic after mild traumatic brain injury, they are often called persistent post-concussive symptoms or post-concussion syndrome. Clinical findings at the time of injury do not reliably predict the development of post-concussive syndrome. Post-concussive syndrome symptoms can overlap those of post-traumatic stress disorder. Neuropsychological testing and use of a symptom checklist are the cornerstones of diagnosis and management. Treatment is symptomatic. We refer patients to a neuropsychologist or a mild traumatic brain injury clinic. Three or more concussions pose a risk for long-term sequelae, especially in adolescents and young children. Almost all cases of second impact syndrome have occurred in young athletes. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, characterized by early onset of memory loss and depression, is a concern in professional athletes. Pathologically large deposits of tau protein are seen in the brains of deceased chronic traumatic encephalopathy patients. Tau protein deposits have recently been discovered even in young football players who died from other causes. Second impact syndrome is a rare disorder that results in rapid cerebral edema and high mortality of 60 to 80 percent. The pathophysiology and predictors are not well understood. It is hypothesized that occurrence of a second impact before the brain has reset or recovered from a first mild traumatic brain injury causes a loss of autoregulation and ion imbalance and leads to rapid cerebral edema. This explanation fits well with the concept of enhanced vulnerability due to metabolic disturbances, energy demand mismatch, and ion channel upregulation after a concussion. Anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents increase the risk of intracranial hemorrhage after injury, especially in the elderly. Intracranial hemorrhage in patients taking warfarin and who have an elevated INR is associated with a high mortality rate of 89%. In general, patients with head trauma who are taking anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents should undergo emergent head CT. The odds ratio for the risk of intracranial lesions after mild head injury in patients taking any antiplatelet therapy is 2.6. Clopidogrel seems to be a potent risk factor. The effect of low-dose aspirin at 162 mg or less taken daily on post-head injury bleeding has not been determined. Patients with intracranial hemorrhage need immediate anticoagulant reversal. Patients taking warfarin who have an elevated INR are optionally treated with plasma or 4-factor concentrate. A negative initial CD finding in asymptomatic traumatic brain injury patient receiving anticoagulation, anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy is reassuring but delayed hemorrhage may occur and is not easily predicted. Our source is Tintinalis Emergency Medicine. Thank you.